Thank you very much. I first have to issue a warning. Last night at 11.30 p.m. I sat in, in Billund Airport in Denmark and got the message that our plane was delayed about three hours. We arrived, arrived in Stansted uh, about three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, this morning, and then everything was stuck. Stansted Express didn't run, and the buses were filled by about a thousand people who wanted to get to London. So we arrived at the hotel at five o'clock this morning, and then we heard that, well, you come too late, you have no room. Then it appeared that we could get a room, but then you don't have a key, so tomorrow you might get a key. So you understand that I haven't slept much, so if I fall asleep before you, <laughs> you will know why. I'm going to do some daring task today, and usually when I talk about this, people first laugh then get a grief and then say, oh, perhaps, perhaps you might have a point. I will define European civilization. Then I will identify some of the antagonist, antagonist of this arrangement. And finally, I will present a theory of just about everything. Actually, this is not new because in 2012, I warned in a paper the decay of Western civilization of the forthcoming demographic collapse if we fail to stop the aggression. And I saw three uh, options then. Either we can submit, we can do some honorable repatriation, or we will have civil war. And of course, some people got very excited about that. And I actually think that European submission is the more likely outcome, and I'll try to argue for that in the following year. The American politician and scientist Charles Murray, he used bibliom bibliometry to define European civilization. He scanned all the catalogues over eminent people and eminent events ever since minus 800 years before the way we counted and up to 1950. What he found was actually quite surprising. More than 80% of all time eminent figures were born or worked in this little tiny polygon in Northwestern Europe you see here. It began in ancient Greek. It really assumed momentum in Southern Italy in the 14th century. It uh, then spread up further north and eminent sons all the time began to migrate to offshoot countries like the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. You know all the names of these people here. They are taking out of more than 1,000 individuals that are also below these eminent top fives who also met Murray's uh, criterion for inclusion. Murray concluded, and it has not been noticed by many, because not many have been so angry over that, that civilization is white, it is male, it's European. He thought that the strange geographical density of eminence was due to social, to religious, and to structural factors, and then he also <laughs> mentioned role learning role modeling. I have a different explanation where IQ plays a major role, but let's first see how IQ differs among people. I don't know, can you see it on the, the last rows down there? Hardly? Some can. IQ is normally distributed in all the countries where we have studied it so far. And here you see it on a scale from 70 to 130. All the eminent people you just saw will you find on the right side of the distribution. Natural scientists score about 127 IQ points, social scientists about 112, which means that eminence comes in standard deviations. 
Social scientists are one standard deviation, natural scientists two standard deviations above the mean. People in ordinary jobs typically have IQs between 80 and 110, and pupil, pu pupil, people with IQs below 90 form a risk group. We have already heard a little about that today. You can see here that almost half of this low IQ or poor IQ group are periodically out of labor. They tend to have many illegitimate children. They tend to live in poverty. They tend to be on uh, chronic welfare. And what is even worse, 90% of those people in this poor IQ group drops out of high school, which means that they will get very little education in, for the rest of their life. In 2012, I did a simple calculation for Denmark, and it appeared that southern non-Western immigrants to Denmark had an average IQ of 86, so they form a high-risk group. And if you look at the data from Danish statistics about how they fare, you can see that it is probably not a wrong assumption to build upon. We know that IQ is the single most important class dividers in all societies we have studied so far. High IQ is behind European uh, imminence. It predicts individual life better than any other single factor we know of. The American psychologist Arthur Jensen, with whom I had the pleasure of work for some time, he found already back in 1999 that it is about 80% heritable and you can't really change it by any known means. The, last, uh, the latter 20% might be idiosyncratic, which means that what affects my IQ will not affect you or vice versa. Uh, Robert Plowman, who works here in, in London, is an eminent behavioral geneticist. I worked together with him uh, 30 years ago when we were at the Behavioral Genetics Institute in Boulder, Colorado. He has recently come to the conclusion that genes is just about everything because parents shape their child's uh, future and upbringing and so on by their genes and the mother and the father gives each half of their genes to the child. So in a sense it's all genetic, which means that the environmental measures are also guided by genetics. Um, <clears throat> IQ differences is really, for many people, something you don't like to hear about. You will have enemies telling you that I, uh, the, um, the European eminence is really European superiority and is supremacy, and it's a way of downgrading other people. IQ researchers are going to tell you that there are differences among the races, and they are racist, they want to to downgrade you. So here is a list of people, of IQ researchers under siege. The list lines up scientists being sanctioned for studying individual, sexual, or race differences in intelligence, or finding biological or genetic influences on behavior. The bar linked indicates the severity of punishment. The American professor Arthur Jensen had just talked about he tops, followed by William Shockley. He was the person who invented the transistor together with two other people. And he was, on his later days as a physicist, very interested in studying intelligence. Uh, I met him once and he said, well, it's not so difficult to define intelligence on the streets because, pe because people come colloquially. Number three on the list is Hans Eising, also working here and followed by Charles Murray, who co-authored the Belko book together with Hernstein. Um, uh, number seven is James Watson. You know him all for the Nobel Prize he got for, uh, for describing the DNA structure. Let me give him an idea of uh, the extent of sanctions. I was unlawfully relieved of my position for doing sex differences research deemed not worthy of a professor at the University of Aarhus. I have been through three court cases and have been exposed for doing wrong research. 
in a, one of the problems is that professional journalists, uh, journals have increasingly been capitulating to political correctness. Before submitting a manuscript, they now warn scientists about words they should not use. They lie about the meaning of the such forbidden words. They even advocate scientists about which line of research they should ought to follow and, and which suit the moral standards of the editors. The, the journal Nature is a good example. Potential authors are now assured that they are, of course, free to report the science, but you better do not reveal that people differ in any way. <laughs> this, is, this, this is not relevant, they say. You better remember that race and ethnicity are just social political constructs. Do you think they differ? Do you still want to publish by us? You should know that we are all equals and that your research better reflect equality among men and women. Would you try a paper in this problem? Probably not. The equally well published magazine National Geographic is no better. They devoted a whole issue to, of race to tell that race is a man up made and not biological concept. And of course, they accused race realists for shamefully using race to define and separate us. In a paper it's called Race uh, as Social Construct, I detailed the academic dishonesty. The answer, none. They couldn't care less. I have previously, also in 2003 and in 2011, wrote some papers criticizing destructive social reductionism and the cancelling of differential psychology, again to no avail. I think this lack of response reflects the conditions for free research and speech under siege. Here you see a global institutional antagonism represented by the former national, uh, the former United Nations Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan. Without blinking, blinking, he said, ex cathedra, that all people in the world have equal IQs. Then he added, well, some people and countries may have suffered bad luck, but a few dollars and a little education will leapfrog boys and girls and poor countries to a higher level faster than the rest of us have had. Here you see little leapfrogging among nations. <laughs> Figure A to the left shows IQ rangings from 56 in the south up to 100 to 105 points, as measured in the descendants of indigenous 14th century people still living there. So this is a picture of what IQ was six, seven hundred years ago. Figure B to the right displays a similar global dispersion of a more precisely measured IQ, no leapfrogging. What Kofi Annan could have said without lying is that IQ is a global commodity with large historical stable differences along a latitudinal gradient and also within countries now and then. He didn't. You might speculate why he did because the evidence was already there at the time. So this is because IQ follows genetics and not educational laws. Afro-American blacks have an average, on average 20% European genes and score average IQ 85. This is halfway between North European and African values as predicted by a polygen admixture theory. The color scale, scale to the left informs us about the future of IQ. It shows that European people have less than 2.05 child per couple. They are leaving, we are leaving the evolutionary scene. At the same time, the number of African babies expands almost exponentially, but we'll get back to that later on. But it explains why the world's average IQ steadily drops day by day. And it's simply because low IQ people have more babies than high IQ people, and that happens also to be explained by north-south differences in fertility. The European Union has another powerful enemy. It even encouraged low IQ immigration. 
Swedish EU Commissioner Ilva Johansson thus welcomed low qualified immigrants. That is southern northwestern immigrants with IQs below 90, about half of whom we already so cannot support themselves and will find it difficult to assimilate or integrate in modern technological countries. The late Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme admitted that the West has lost its culture. The politi politician Mona Salin, who once was a candidate for the Prime Minister post in Sweden, she long encouraged immigration to Sweden and then said that Swedes should envy the common culture immigrants bring to Sweden. The late French Count uh, Coven Kovenhover Kalagi fought nationalism and recommended increasingly ethnic uh, come together with a common culture. Anybody who knows about genetic laws would say the world is not fit for ideas like that. Do the world's people differ in sociability? To find out, I factor analyze some social variables you can see here, and they had a, a fairly a good factor structure. So I looked for how this measure of, you could say, sociability, altruism, is fitting into a latitudinal gradient. The red circle encircles southern countries up to about the medieval, uh, the midi, midi, what do you, the, 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 the fourth uh, degree of latitude and in the Mediterranean, see, I'm sorry, should have been born English, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and those in the red circle are those uh, above 40 degrees latitude. Most government in these northern countries in the blue circle have actually accepted the social contract. If you protect us, we will protect you and your freedom, but it appears that this contract has had some problems in recent times. If you don't feel terrified by seeing this curve, you haven't really understood it. Europe is losing reproductive, the reproductive game to southern non-Western populations. The 0, 0.0 marks on the left axis signalize average global fertility. Irrespective of how you measure it, people living in warm countries like Africa and the Middle East have three to four more children than those living in cold countries. We have already heard Dotan talk a little bit about that. Any geographic area with a long-term fertility below 2.05 are doomed evolutionary, like Europeans. And the fertile immigration recommended by Gaddafi and Erdogan reinforces the process. They see it. The tragic is that we don't. Now we come to uh, an, an, a thing that has already been discussed, the Marxistic overtake of Europe. Left-wing reformists have, by little, have little by little occupied our educational systems, the universities, the media, and now holds the key to inform school children, students, and the public, and I think Geoffrey knows about that, uh, about what is right and wrong while cancelling opponents. Let me be specific and present an American example. At Boston University, at the bottom, there are today 22 faculty members voting for the Democratic Party for each Republican. At Brown University at the top, the ratio of Democrats to Republican is 60 to 1. When I first saw that, I really didn't believe it and said, well, but it appears that that's the case. Here's another way to illustrate the left liberal occupation. The upper black line reflects the income and dominance by far left uh, liberal college faculty members over the periods from 1990 to, uh, to uh, 2014. Moderate or far, far right conservative proportions dropped in the same period to below 30% uh, uh, according to this survey. 
Here you see one result of it. I just talked about Charles Murray, the co-author of the Belko book. He tried to give a lecture here, and then the liberal left occupants came and canceled the lecture. And actually, it was so bad that when he had to flee out in a taxi, the dean, the female dean, was following him out. And then come some, came some of the, uh, the activists and hit, but unfortunately hit the dean on the neck, so he had to go to the hospital. So Charles uh, went safely into his taxi. But again, this is an example of how severely our academic institutions has been corrupted by the liberal left. And then, of course, the sign no eugenics also shows that when you are a leftist activist, and I have to admit an excuse, I have been one in my very young days. I was with the occupation of the Copenhagen University and I thought we were great. But then uh, things happened. I began familiar with the evidence and have to excuse, sorry. This is just one of many examples of misinformed student activists canceling free speech and research at American and also European university, including my university, Aarhus. The academic labor has squeezed academic uh, uh, conservative <laughs> faculty members out of British universities already since the 1960s. Labor goes up from 45 in 60 to 70% in 2015, whereas conservative drops from 33% to 11% over the same period. British universities are no better. The Danish School of Journalism has also capitulated to the great left liberal takeover. Close to half of all the students vote for one of the three left-leaning political parties in the Red Rectangle. The most popular party is in his list an heir of the former Communist Party in Denmark. I was also a little worried when I saw that. But now you can also explain why Danish media is left-leaning. They uh, No wonder that they uh, downplay the left-inspired extremism and exaggerate right-inspired episodes. And I have to see Emil Kierkegaard is here somewhere. He's responsible for these statistics. The top national media, Danish Radio, reports that about 75% of all extremism is caused by right-oriented actors. As you can see from the length of the blue line top there. In contrast, only about 10% extremism is due to left liberal actors and 10% to religious or anarchic uh, uh, activists. Most of the other public media below agree that close to 50% extremism is communist by right wing actors. Now look at the right table. Europol tells us that there are 96 right wing theorists who were arrested in Europe between 2006 to 12, and fully 287 left wingers or anarchists were detained and no less than 1,215 terror attacks were religiously expired, inspired. So Danish media is lying systematically. I see a pattern here. It might not be a conspiracy. It might be an empirical fact. Another formidable enemy of Western civilization is Islam. Islamic leaders do not blend their words in any way. But, uh, they have plans for taking over Europe. Muammar Gaddafi, the former late uh, Libyan president, instructs a vast audience of Muslims in this Al Jazeera video about how to conquer Europe. Don't shoot them. Don't bomb them. No tanks in their streets. Just occupy Europe with Muslima baby, baby carriages. When I saw that first, I froze. If you don't freeze, there's something wrong with you. Ah. Current President Erdogan of Turkey has a similar plan. Let Muslim women in Europe have three, not five children. I have five, three, not, not three, but five children. Same message. It's that easy to take over naive Europe, she said. 
And by the way, remember, we already have established a religious organization within the gates of Europe to keep an eye on Islamophobes. They are sick people, critical of Islam, and they have to be reported and punished. I can't think of a clear message for our destiny and their brave future. Thus, while our politicians call about party activities in Downing Street doing corona restrictions, other carryouts well planned and realistic demographic replacement of Western democracy. What is worse, Islam already has many powerful acolytes over with, within the gates of Europe, and the European Union is one of them. The former Sec Foreign Secretary Federica Mogherini thus said in 2015 that Islam is already everywhere in Europe. This is reality. Islam is an important part of the future of Europe. She then talks about the democratic process. It's all in democracy to do that. Reality is that EU is on the way to cancel Western democracy, promote Sharia, and harm female rights. Another powerful acolyte is the American President Joe Biden. Already as a presidential candidate, he proclaimed that our school children should be taught more about Islam, and so should we. Do you agree, Jeffrey? Not entirely. My first thing as president will be to open the now closed gates for further Muslim immigration. Next, I will charge Trump for inducing a morbid and irrational fear of Islam in the American people. And now we have them here. Open gates. We find and hear Muslims in our street in Holland and in England. And they do not look exactly like positive immigrants wanting to assimilate smoothly and serve their new host country. Not a few natives brainwashed by the liberal left call protesters for Islamic Islamophobes. Such imbalances illustrate that Western governments are failing utterly, in my opinion, to keep their part of the social contract, namely to defend our country and citizen if we leave the force to them. The left map, map localizes the geographic density of Muslims by still darker colors. The right side maps and it proves that Muslim density overlaps with the frequency of cousin marriages. Muslim cousin marriages increases the risk of recessive genetic disorders. This has been known very long. No less than 55% Pakistani in Britain marry a first cousin, many of whom coming from repeat generation of this marital arrangement. A report indicates that their children suffer 13 times more genetic disorders than Brits, and one in 10 dies early on or suffer serious disability. BBC, who reported this in 2007, also said that Pakistani Britain only accounts for 3% of all births in the UK, but nevertheless produce just under a third of all British children with genetic diseases. My guess is that the West irrational cancellation of eugenic programs since the 1948, when the United Nations banned such research, is responsible for this disaster. The sheer number, culture, and religion of Muslims may overwhelm the Western world and change us forever. Just look at the circles to the right, documenting the outcome of a pew. PEW Pew Research Center survey. They found 1.6 billion Muslims globally and about 1.4 billion uh, finds that the wife should obey her husband. I'm actually in favor, but uh, my wife <laughs> disagrees a little bit. <coughs> 1.1 billion prefer Sharia law uh, ruling. 750 millions call for death over adultery, and a little less than 600 million demands death over leaving Islam. Christianity is a 
less stronger religion in that sense. It's a bad match. So now look at the categorized table to the left. There you see about 80% of Pakistanis prefer stoning of people committing adultery and committing of cutting of hands and theft for theft and robbery and killing people for leaving Islam. Pew also find that 70% of Muslim immigrants to Europe wants to install Sharia and to cancel the autonomous European law codex. And this is already happening in significant areas of Scandinavian Britain and of the rest of Europe in parallel societies. What can we make of all this? I, think that I find it's a little danger to European civilization in the liberal left takeover of our educational and ac academic institutions and the media. They have appropriated the right to define what is good, bad, and whom or what should be cancelled. The Western politicians are all guilty of allowing biological warfare by genetic means against our civilization. We once stopped Islam outside the gates of Vienna, but may be less successful today when many enemies already are inside the city walls and the attention and determination of the defenders is wanting. It is time to hold these weaklings responsible and to establish forceful countermeasures. The West has had an irresponsible immigration policy since the 1960s, in part being seduced by the liberal left and other antagonists of European civilization. We all have failed in realizing the genetic nature of different ecotypes. This is the new buzzword uh, replacing race. I will come to that in a minute. Our manifest unwillingness to defend our unique free societies actually work to the detriment of us all. We learn nothing from creating a black underclass in the United States with average IQ 85. So now we mindlessly create a similarly frustrated low IQ underclass in Europe. This irrational policy harms immigrants and hosts alike, and there seems to be no end of this. I fear we are close to losing our wonderful open democratic societies and ourselves. The obvious next question is, what can we do to endure, or have we already reach the point of no return. A rational analysis of the current situation suggests that we have to take back our institutions first and resume the democratic right to define human and societal goals. We must recognize that immigration problems cannot be solved by social engineering because they have roots in prehistoric evolution and polity in selection. Let's therefore look back in prehistoric evolution when anatomically modern Africans began migrating up north some 300,000, 275,000 years ago. These black equatorial people had to pass through still colder climatic belts with decreasing sun power, irradiation, before they could enter the cold red circle of imminence in northwestern Europe. This is my simplest explanation of a model that will explain everything. <coughs> Nobody laughing yet? Um, it summarizes some observations. Let's start in the upper left corner where irradiation or sun energy flows down and fuels the formation of compounds with the blue uh, arrows at the bottom. And it uh, then uh, it gives uh, possibilities for forming cells, organs, human traits, civilization, and even to estimate earthly conditions. The text boxes following the red tilted circle arrows to the right describes where, when, and how ecotypes, some might still call it race, I call it ecotype because it's empirically defined where they were formed. To make a long story short, this is a new thermodynamic model for what we in old days called the formation of race differences in brain, intelligence, and behavior, but not on an entirely empirical way. The echograph, which is the blue rectangle at the bottom of it, 
with the rounded corner illustrates how irradiation energizes compound cells, organs, and so, and give rise to anatomically modern zoicotypes. Now, when oh, perhaps I should put some, when you look at the the lower one here, this is ecotype five. Can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. This is ecotypes five, formed 275,000 years ago. They live closely around the equator, have a brain size of 1,300 cubic centimeter, an IQ of 68, and they have very low education, altruism, and, and civilization. As this echograph, with all these reorganizations of the human body and brain, moves up to the next energy level, which is about 4,700 joules per square meter, then you will get ecotype 4. They are formed 76,000 years ago, have a higher latitude, a brain size increase, and IQ 72, 68 here. Low education, not very low education, altruism and self-altruism. As the echograph moves up here, you have the energy level here, where they have lived on 45,000 years ago, brain size improved to 1,325 cubic centimeter, IQ 85. We are talking about the Mediterranean area here. And average education and so on, globally speaking, of course, to, it, it looked at our perspective, it's low education. Then the echo graph goes up here. We have ecotype 2, that's southern Europe. They have a brain size of 1332. IQ 95, high education, altruism, and so on. And then the echograph goes up to the upper one, echotype one, that's you. We have an, uh, a latitude average of 52, a brain size of 1355, IQ 98, very high education, altruism, and so on. And this is all mapped along the axis, and everything in this rests on empirical uh, measures not on subjective ideas. Are you black? Well, you have one drop black blood, then you must be black and so on. No, you don't have to categorize people any longer by what they think they are. You can ask, where have your grandparents for the last 100,000 years lived? And you have a, an empirical definition of an ecotype. So please don't mention the word race anymore. Talk about ecotypes, empirical defined. Now, when we know our evolutionary past, we can begin to talk about how ecotypes interact. What goes wrong when very different ecotypes migrate into new ecosomes, and what measures are needed to defend European civilization? We must improve the fertility of ecotypes one and two and support educations of their wife. We must stop the immigration and support of ecotypes three, four, and five. We must stop programs for assimilating and integrating these types, ecotypes, because they cannot benefit from them and return them in an honorable way with an excuse. I think Western civilization has done a tragic, friendly move of inviting people who comes from a genetic background that is incompatible with ours up here. We should excuse, we should make money, and we should send them home. We must ask our politicians to estimate the full costs of failed integration and programs and submit the results to the public without lift, lift, leftist infiltration. We must ask for realistic estimates of the long-term demographic consequences of four ecotypes one and two of immigration from ecotypes three, four, and five. We must restrict membership of international institutions, hinder us in doing so. We must return criminal ecotypes and stop immigration of the few high IQ ecotypes 3, 4, and 5. And this is an important point. In the blackest of Africa, you still find highly gifted people. They are just fewer than you find up here. It's a question of... Uh, of the dispersion, and you should never say black people have this or that intelligence because they represent a normal distribution around a just lower mean. The same for sex differences. I have 
had so many problems with journalists who couldn't understand that. I'm not saying people are dumber than, that women are dumber than men, because that's always the headline when they do an interview. I said, some of these people are I, it might be possible that the most gifted person in this room is a female, overweight, black woman. You should really realize that. Okay, we must, uh, we must ask uh, Ecotype 3, 4, and 5 for implementing responsible family programs before we provide them with further economic support. We must ask we must counter Islam's uh, plans to take over the open Western democracy. This includes returning all ecotypes attempting to introduce Sharia. Um, I don't know if all of you know that, but a famous Nazi once said, we use democracy to overtake democracy. We haven't learned anything because he was a Nazi, so we couldn't see anything that we could also use. But history will prove something true. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.